Okay, so real quick update, because a lot of people have been asking, and I want to make sure to get this out to, you know, the most people in this form, just in case I've forgotten to talk to you and give you an update. Here's an update. Scout is doing great. She recovered from her injury with her broken arm, and she's in another cast, well, a, a fracture brace for an additional three weeks, and she's recovered very well from her unrelated surgery that was scheduled before she broke her arm. Everything's doing well. She's back in school. She's awesome. She's all the things. She'll come say hi, you know, when she's around. But right now she's not because she's in school. So thank you very much for asking about her. Uh, she definitely appreciates it. She loves feeling loved. And she knows that the Sudzers do love her. That has nothing whatsoever to do with what we are making or doing or talking about today. But it was asked. And I wanted to make sure that you guys were kept apprised of all situations. I will tell you what we are doing today in just a minute. But before I do... Hello, I am Mrs. Soap and Clay. Let's make stuff. How's it going, Sudzers? Welcome back to the channel. You are at Soap and Clay, where we make all the soapy things. And you were here for basically a follow-up week from a few weeks ago when we did a bunch of reacts and we went to TikTok and we went to soap making forums and we talked about interesting information, unpopular opinions, maybe some bad information, some fun ways to do melt and pour. And a lot of questions arose in all of that. And I wanted to address the big ones and effectively the ones that had like the most interest and you know, you guys wanted to see more of. So today we are going to start out with what survives saponification. Now, for those of you who may be new here and may not know, I guess it's time every once in a while I should update and I forget to do this. Yes, I am a professional soap maker. I have been doing this for a very long time. I've had a brick and mortar since 2016 where I teach classes to children, to adults, all of the things. I also teach classes online. And my education, while varied, or I guess the education that actually matters for this particular channel is chemistry. And so that's what I try to do within every all the content on this channel. So it's not just hey, here's a recipe, good luck, or here, here's a beautiful pour, good luck. It's more demystifying the soap making process, helping you to become a better soap maker, a better critical thinker in applying your technique and your skills to other recipes within your soap making journey, and uh, helping you really understand, and as I said, demystify the chemistry process, the scientific process behind soap making. And so today, while we are going to be talking about what survives saponification, I am going to try very, very hard to not get too in the weeds with the super like highbrow chemistry stuff that you don't really need to know about. But that said, I know that I do have a tendency to kind of go off with stuff like that. So if I do, I apologize in advance. But you're going to go talk about what survives saponification while we are making, you know, stuff that did saponify. So that's fun, you know, because I'm making soap. It's not really related to the content that we're talking about. I just want to give you something interesting to watch while I basically word vomit. So let's get to the video and we can do all of that there. Okay, so saponification and what survives it? I mean, obviously the short answer to that is everything that is not saponifiable, survives saponification. But, you know, you're here for a more in-depth response to that because what does that actually mean? Well, first off, let's just talk about uh, what saponification is, just generally. But obviously this is applied chemistry, so within soap making, because that's literally what it means, that's where, where the word soap comes from. So saponification is going to be the alkaline hydrolysis 
of fatty oils, also known as esters. We also call them fatty acids. Triglycerides, primarily, so a glycerin backbone, you know, which leads to soap. What is hydrolysis? What does that mean? Well, the hydrolysis is the chemical breakdown of a compound due to a reaction with water. And so that's hydrolysis in general. Alkaline hydrolysis tells us that you need an alkaline in order to achieve so soap, saponification, so the breakdown of these fatty acids or esters. Now, the saponification value that we give things, that's determining, you know, how much of a you know, your alkaline, so either your potassium hydroxide or your sodium hydroxide, depending on whether you're making a liquid or a solid soap, is needed to convert a particular oil to, you know, soap. So what does that mean generally for us? Well, I mean, high level, it means basically all of the fatty materials present within an oil is saponifiable. Now, that's not to say that every single oil has just saponifiable fatty acids, fatty esters, within its composition. Uh, shea butter, as an example, that has a very high amount of unsaponifiables because there are things that cannot be saponified. And those things are, you know, like steroids, right? Cholesterol is a steroid. It cannot be saponified. Other steroids that exist within like shea butter, for example, it can't be saponified. Antioxidants cannot be saponified. This is a really basic way of saying it, but really because they do not contain that glycerin three chain backbone. That's not a triglyceride. Triglycerides are going to be reasonably easy to saponify within, you know, our soap making practices. So broadly speaking, triglyceride is a lipid that can be saponified and everything else that exists within our fatty oils, within our oils that we use for soap making cannot be. So again, steroids, amino acids, so proteins, you know, cholesterol, terpenes, uh, obviously, mineral oil that cannot be saponified because that has a hydrocarbon chain, not a triglyceride. So there's broadly speaking what can and cannot. However, that does not mean that an oil is considered unsaponifiable if it contains any unsaponifiable materials. Those materials still exist within the oil, but they will not turn into soap when they go through this alkaline hydrolysis because they have no fatty acids in their composition. So again, steroids, amino acids, they are unsaponifiable. So theoretically they exist within your finished soap. Proteins and amino acids a number of times for a very real reason. Because when we are looking at what survives saponification, I think it's very important to look at your protein structures for a number of reasons. A, proteins can provide lots of benefits, obviously, to the skin. But two, the proteins, the amino acids, that's where a lot of allergens are found. So if you are wondering if you can get away with, say, you know, having a nut oil in your soap, and giving it to somebody with a nut allergy, I would say no, don't don't do that, because you know that 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 could be a protein allergy. You know what I mean? So I would go ahead and caution you to not do something like that, because proteins they cannot be saponified, therefore they do exist in the finished product. I have a number of times explained this in sort of like a honeycomb, you know, state or whatever. So. Basically, you have your lye solution, so your water and your alkaline, and you have your oils, and they are going to take the path of least resistance to get to each other, to saponify, to, you know, end up with soap. And everything else that they're sort of pushing out of the way to get to that, to achieve that goal, sort of gets bound up around that. And so it is a very important thing to consider when you are making specific soaps. Do these things survive? Yeah, they, they certainly do. So proteins, amino acids, same thing. Again, steroids, so cholesterol, et cetera, and so forth. So for that, what does that actually mean for our soap making purposes? Well, it means that our soaps can do a lot of really cool things, you know? Like, yeah, these things exist. Can we say they exist? No, we cannot say they exist. We cannot say that there's a benefit. But is there a benefit? Well, I mean, there's lots of antioxidants hanging out in a bar of soap that's made out of a bunch of shea butter, and antioxidants are great for the skin. So, no, you can't say anything about it, but is it there? Yes, those things are present, and topically we do have studies about the impacts and the benefits of antioxidants, etc., on the skin. So yeah, 
it, it, it can be. We are going to get more into that tomorrow when we talk about what actually penetrates the skin uh, with tomorrow's video. But for now, let's just stick with that. And I think the big question with all of it is how about essential oils? Do essential oils actually survive saponification? What are they made of? Do they burn off? What is this flashpoint? Does any of it survive or matter? Okay, so essential oils, do they exist? Do they survive saponification? Do they exist? Are they present afterwards within the soap? Um, I don't know that you're ever going to get a chemist to actually answer definitively yes or no on this for a number of reasons. One of the reasons is it's kind of a loaded question because what specifically are you asking? We know that essential oils are a hot button issue as far as whether it's good for aromatherapy or good topically. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of peer reviewed studies that are out there that actually say yes or no on either one of those. So from a scientific perspective, it's kind of a, a scary thing to even start talking about whether or not, you know, essential oils are going to survive. Um, because if you are meaning aromatherapy, well, I mean, we know that they survive because we can smell them. You know what I mean? So sure. Okay, cool. But if we're meaning like topically and what this does for the skin or whatever, I mean, there aren't enough studies out there to say that they do anything to the skin. Not peer reviewed studies. Do not come for me. I am just speaking in a broad, okay, moving on. But to the chemical composition of an essential oil, I mean, yeah, essential oils are not made of fatty acids. They are volatile plant materials. And so they shouldn't change chemically within saponification by nature of, you know, what saponification is. So yeah, to that, do they exist? Sure. Uh, as far as whether or not they survive the heat, uh, they, they should absolutely survive the heat. I think a lot of people get flashpoint kind of confused. They think flashpoint means that's the level at which the essential oil is, is bad, you know, but that's not the case. That's more of a, a safety issue, you know, so if it gets too hot, things can explode when they're in, it's all a thing, but it doesn't actually impact what the chemical composition of the essential oil is at the end of all of it. So you're not losing anything there. You might lose stuff just by basic evaporation because again, these are volatile, you know, chemical compounds with these essential oils. So they could, they could be lost through evaporation. Sure. But chemically speaking, no, I think they, they remain again, as we can tell, because we can smell them. Does that mean that all the benefits from the essential oil remain? Oh, that's cool. That kind of looks like I don't know, like a cool helmet from Skyrim or something. But we know that they exist because we can smell them. But as far as what they do for the skin and if there's any sorts of benefits to that, A, these are not claims that we can make with essential oils for a number of reasons. One, these are not at all governed by the FDA. They won't touch them. They just consider them a fragrance. And two, there just aren't enough studies generally to know what essential oils do or do not do with the skin, with the exception of some. You know, there are some known things out there like tea tree for example it's a good anti-inflammatory um but as far as i don't know getting an official weigh-in on it yeah no there'd have to be actual peer-reviewed studies like we would actually have to have somebody test all of these and determine whether there's you know a bar of regular soap with no essential oils and a bar of soap with essential oils same you know recipe formulation same everything and if there's any actual difference between the two. And that involves testing that, as I've said before, scientific community doesn't really care about soap. So uh, it's not likely that you're going to get anyone to want to test that. So, I mean, high level, technically speaking, chemically speaking, yeah, they, they do survive. I don't want you to take that to mean that it survives in a way that you're going to go off and, you know, tell all your friends that Mrs. Soap and Clay said, you know, essential oils are better than fragrance. Cause I, for my part, do not believe that at all, at all. I think fragrances are far superior, but you know, that's just within the practice of how we make soap and what our ROI is. But you know, for the rest of it, just that I'm saying that it does some sort of thing. I don't really believe that to be the case, but not really because the essential oil 
is untested, although that does contribute, but more so because again, soap is a rinse off product. We will talk more about that tomorrow because that said, I use essential oils in a boatload of my leave-on products, almost exclusively for my leave-on products, you know, that you're going to find essential oils in there instead of fragrance oils because it's one of those if you, you know, it works if you believe it type situations, kind of, but also because there are things that can penetrate and provide, you know, a benefit to the skin within essential oils. It's just... uh not really something that can be found when you are dealing with a rinse off product like soap. So going back to the ROI conversation, that's why I prefer fragrance oils. But again, I guess finer point on it. Yeah. Chemically essential oils do, do survive and do not take my words and run with them as I am saying something that I'm not Please and thank you. But Overall, you can probably hopefully walk away from this video knowing that, yeah, essential oils in general and well, really not essential oils in general, anything that is unsaponifiable survives saponification. Basically in its existing, you know, it's, it's original chemical state. There are of course other you know, clays, for example, because there's water involved in all of it. It changes a little bit, but really not much. So those benefits exist. And I don't know, you guys are, I can't believe that I actually decided to take this question with the essential oils, but there you go. That's, that's saponifiable versus unsaponifiable and what we get in soap. So yeah, there it is. I mean, really high level, what survives saponification? Uh, things that are not saponifiable. What that is, however, is a different question uh, for sure. And for the essential oils bit, um, I kind of weigh in in the yeah parts of essential oils do survive saponification obviously because we can smell them you know what I mean but whether or not that is changed because of saponification because certain compounds are saponifiable whereas certain others within the same essential oil are not and that really does depend on what you consider the benefits of essential oils to be right we don't really have a whole lot of great information and by great i mean peer-reviewed journals actual medical studies being done on the benefits of essential oils topically or match with the aromatherapy version so it, if all you want is the scent and the aromatherapy version is there and it's going to be tricking the senses into you know lavender is calming and then yeah it survives to the rest of it I, the easiest thing to do is just to assume that part of everything that you put into the soap that is not your fatty acid is going to survive in some form because that chemical process pretty basic i know it's really cool and fun and all the jazz but it really is kind of a basic process and i've described it as sort of a honeycomb you know in the in the past so everything's just gonna kind of get bound up inside of the saponification, like your clays and whatnot, inside sort of a honeycomb grid. And so, yes, there is the potential that you're getting the benefits of your clays to, you know, whatever, all the things. There it is. I hope you guys learned something. I hope you guys are gonna enjoy this week. I really am going to enjoy this week, I think, and I am going to do a good job, you know, fingers crossed, with uh, not getting too off of the beaten path and just completely you know, going down completely different rabbit holes that maybe we don't need to go down, but maybe we do need to go down them. So comment below. Let me know what you think, what else you're confused on, what I confused you more on. Thank you for being here. Sudzers, thank you for existing. Thank you for being you. Thank you for caring about Scout. You know, it makes me very happy and not at all bothered when you guys are asking me questions about that. It lets me know that you care. We all have a lot of things going on right now and that's one of my things. So I appreciate you. I'm out of here, but I will see you guys all again tomorrow for another round of uh, answering questions and demystifying soap processes. Soapy fun. Bye.